I know that calls won't, uh, the callers won't mind uh, just waiting for a few moments. So 1-800-316-316. Paul, just take us into your story here uh, briefly and uh, give us some insight into the dramatic change that came when you called out for help from God. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Uh, and my story, honestly, is is God's story. Uh, I grew up in a beautiful home and uh, didn't see signs of anything being amiss, but I developed an anxiety problem at quite young. They found out that I was bright and they sort of moved me forward in school a year, and uh, but I got treated for this anxiety issue. I then got on with life throughout my teen years, playing lots of sport and studying quite well and just generally loving what I did. But the anxiety thing never really left. And then after getting into a medical science degree and then finally medicine, it increased. I felt more and more angsty, like something just wasn't right. And I had a consciousness of God, but I certainly wasn't living for him. And to be honest, I don't think I knew how to. Uh, and eventually the anxiety uh, escalated as I began work as a doctor and I just had no way of coping, turned to alcohol, turned to drugs and was a mess. Uh, in a rehab of all places, uh, I, I was at a point of desperation and I had tried every kind of thing that you could try. You know, I'm, I'm medically trained, so I know about all the therapies and the different medicines you can take and none of them really worked. And so in desperation, I cried out to God and said, I just really need your help. Now, things didn't instantly, you know, it wasn't a thunderbolt from from the Lord and I just got zapped and I was healed. There was a process involved and uh, that process went on for many years. But what shifted as as I turned to the Lord was that hope began to rise up on the inside. By the time I I got to rehab, I'd lost hope. I'd tried every other thing to get well. Uh, but hope just hit my heart that maybe one day I could get well and and that God was real. And if God was real, then I had to shift everything about the way I thought. And so I, in a moment of just total surrender, I said, God, if you want this little life, this broken life, you can have it. And, well, he, he took it. <laughs> Since then I got better and better and better. I um, actually reached a very funny point. I was offered a medical job as a a hospital job in Perth, and uh, I felt that this was the most natural thing to do. You know, you study for eight years to, <laughs> to become a doctor. I thought I'd be a missionary doctor, uh, but the Lord had other plans in my devotional life. Uh, I just began coming across scripture after scripture where God was seeming to say to me to stay and look after this little flock. And uh, eventually he made it very clear to me uh, that I needed to stay, and I was in unpaid youth ministry at the time. And I bit the bullet and I stayed and I haven't looked back since. And uh, now I know it's the right decision. And Paul, this is only something like eight years ago. And uh, yeah, so it's it's recent. And you say that you were pretty well unrecognizable. So discovering normal for you actually started with calling out to God and with his uh, relational interventions into your life, you can actually then discern uh, what's normal. And so we're, while we're talking a lot about sexuality today, there's a whole lot of dimensions to our lives. It starts with uh, the God who is our creator. There's an old expression, you know, uh, uh, when you're in doubt, go to the manufacturer's instructions. So you've got, the, you've got the, the instructions that come from the creator about what's normal. Just very quickly, because we'll take a call in a moment, but, uh, but around discerning what's normal and the manufacturer's instructions, any thoughts here? Yes, what a great way to put it. I love that. Yeah, the, <laughs> more than his instructions, his very presence is found uh, in his word. I, I love that. But, uh, you know, my life's not it's, not, it's not remarkable. You know, I just lived out Ecclesiastes, to be honest. You know, you can look at drug addiction, pornography addiction, lust, hypersexuality, whatever it is. To be honest, they are just the noticeable forms of idolatry. But before I landed on the noticeable forms of idolatry, my life was consumed by the less noticeable forms, which were equally idolatry. First of all, it was career. When I get, when I become a doctor, then I'll be okay. Before that, it was a girl. You know, when I have a pretty girlfriend, then things will be all right. Before that, it was approval from peers. You know, there's many forms of socially acceptable idolatry. 
And to be honest, I'm blessed that I pursued those uh, and found them wanting very young. By, by such a young age, I realized there was nothing in them for me and there had to be something more. And of course, that's the message in Ecclesiastes, the fear of the Lord. <laughs> Uh, can I just say that relates deeply to our, our message in pornography. Although there's this awful thing, this awful exposure on the earth, what I see, I mean, I'm around young people all the time, what I see is hearts that are getting hungry for something more very early on. 30 years ago, you maybe wanted to pursue sexuality and you'd have to wait until you were of age. You'd have to wait until there was opportunity. Now everything is at your fingertips. I can have it all now and people are learning younger and younger that it's meaningless. It's all meaningless. It's hevel. It's vapor. And when people realize that, they actually, many of them, well, tragically, many of them suicide. But on the flip side of that, many realize that there has to be something more and that that something more is found only in the spiritual dimension, found in the person we know of Jesus Christ.